want to introduce Reinhold Martin. Uh, Reinhold Martin is a professor of architecture here at Columbia, where he directs the Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture. He has published widely on the history and theory of modern and contemporary architecture, and he directs the history theory sequence here at GSAP. Uh, the Buell Center's work on housing and real estate includes the multi-year project House Housing, an untimely history of architecture and real estate, the publication The Art of Inequality, Architecture, Housing, and Real Estate, a Provisional Report, the exhibitions Living in America, Frank Lloyd Wright, Harlem, and Modern Housing, as well as Foreclosed, Rehousing the American Dream, and the workshops Public Housing, Public Sphere. Um, so it's my pleasure to bring everyone together. Leave it to you, Reinhold. Thank you. Yes, it's quite a responsibility. Thank you, Hillary. Hi, how's everybody doing? How are you guys doing? Um, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> I have some thoughts. I mean, I, I feel a little bit of a responsibility towards the, the larger themes of the conference since we're the kind of wrap-up panel, and maybe we can step back. Uh, but, but here, I mean, I, actually, I'm, I'm interested to know, this is really just a, an open question about the paradigm part. Because, so if, if uh, the, one of the functions of a conference like this is to assess, I don't know, in the last decade or so, maybe more, of housing design um, in North America, there's a, there are three components. There's the design component, which I'd like to try to articulate uh, as uh, succinctly and uh, but also as deeply as possible, uh, the, um, the North American element, uh, which is interesting in its own way, and, and just the various practices represented here, I think, speak to that, uh, and then the paradigm. So if I were to answer the question, under what paradigm do we live and work and design, act, in other words, today, uh, I think I wouldn't be alone in calling that paradigm neoliberal. In other words, if there is a consensus about, about something like a paradigm shift that has occurred over, normally it'd be in the last 40, 50 years, depending on how you, how you date this, the early 70s is, is usually where, where the you know, inflection point is, 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 is located, we'd be saying, you know, that's the real shift. The real paradigm shift has been uh, to the, the, the neoliberal turn, the turn towards uh, a neoliberal city, neoliberal policies, and so on. So, so that's a way of asking, first of all, the, the question uh, to you broadly about whether you think that's a reasonable or accurate way to, to describe uh, the world that we're living and working and acting in, uh, and secondly, to think whether that could be changed. Because you know, paradigm shifts are usually narrated, more, more, more traditionally narrated as revolutions, as like positive change in some way or another. This has been a revolution. Uh, but I think most of us would agree that this has not been uh, a revolution um, that has benefited the vast majority of the people who live in the world in which we live and act, including in the housing that you all design. So, uh, so the, how, how architecture as design uh, uh, but also as a kind of public act, uh, can address the revolution uh, in, in which we are living and, and working, the neoliberal revolution, uh, is, would be my first question. I have other more specific, you know, sort of architecture-specific questions about typology uh, after that, but, but maybe we could start with this sort of the paradigm part. I also want to talk about North America. Anybody have any thoughts about neoliberalism? Maybe not. I mean, I would say um, the shift is radical because, I mean, for, for, from a Canadian yeah. perspective, in 1867, 80% of Canadians lived in rural settings mm -hmm. and 20% of Canadians lived in cities. Yeah. So the entire structure, the legislation, the kind of uh, acts that created cities, they were really the kind of the, the, the child of the federal and provincial government. Right. Uh, now, 85% of Canadians live in cities, and that, but we are governed by that same framework from 1867. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of problematic condition that doesn't actually understand that right now cities are the economic engine of our country anyhow, mm -hmm. 
and that the kind of growth that's taken place, the migration from rural to urban is the paradigm shift. Mm. And that's taken place over a long time period, but it's been accelerated since the 70s. Mm. So, so in a way, it's kind of this mass migration that's taken place has meant that cities have a role and an importance and a need for housing that I think is actually more pressing yeah. than it was in 1867. Yeah. I'll just add a little quick uh, footnote because I want to get others. Uh, 1872 was when Friedrich Engels published The Housing Question, Wohnungsfrage, which is all about the problem of rural to urban migration, specifically um, what he called uh, bourgeois solutions, which is to say usually architect solutions to the housing question. Uh, as preventing proletarianization in cities and therefore, thereby preventing uh, you know, the organization of labor that Michael mentioned uh, or uh, other political acts. Right? So the rural to urban thing is part of this story for sure, I think, but, but it's, it's a long, that's a longer uh, time span that, that is associated with other uh, political economic paradigms or models of the sort that you described. I, I'm, so I'm curious, and maybe we can come back, about what the, the specifically neoliberal, which is usually associated with deregulation, privatization, and so on, uh, how that, what, we could ask how that plays into the urban, uh, you know, identification, but others? Well, uh, I think anyway. that, yeah. um, uh, for me, the, the real paradigm would be to understand that uh, we are in a moment where we need to uh, reverse the situation where right now housing it's a financial act mm -hmm. and this is why i like this title of this conference because uh, um, i think it should become a design act needing a financial sustainability to become uh, a solution for the masses but with no doubt like putting design uh, uh, as mm -hmm. as as a first necessity to fulfill really the possibilities of doing a house, you know, making housing, uh, and not only as an operation, you know, you know as, a, as a physical representation of it. So I think that um, uh, the neoliberalization neo neo of the economy like prohibited that, or prohibited that thing to, to happen. And I think that um, it is not only uh, the task of, um, uh, of everybody to, to do that, but it's also the, the architects that we should start like uh, really pushing towards that direction. No? I would like to. Hi. I, I, I agree with Tatiana completely. But uh, what I think is that even the architects are proposing these, these things. We have like the codes or the normative, or I don't know how to say it, that it's a long process. No? First, we're thinking, which is legal to think, and then we need to legalize what we think mm -hmm. with the codes and the government and the developers because we are like a little seed in the whole process, no? I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Maurice, maybe yeah. has a different perspective. I just, uh, no, I would just um, um, frame it as growth, obviously, is one of the things that Detroit is trying to induce, um, which means we are, in many instances, deregulating yeah. uh, a lot of uh, red tape and hurdles to development. So the parking question that uh, Lorcan brought up, you know, we got that. We've, <laughs> we've uh, the developments that you're seeing are vastly underparked, uh, and that's by regulation. Um, but the inclusion part is highly regulated uh, because there is an affordable housing um, inclusionary uh, component. Um, we own the land. So we dictate the terms. Uh, that's, um, again, pretty present. Um, but I think that um, cities, or cities like Detroit um, have to be about growth. Uh, I think what is um, um, important about the experiment is that there is a desire to have zero displacement. Uh, so we're, we don't accept that in order to regenerate the city, you have to displace one people for another people. Uh, and so uh, I don't know where that, that sets us, but I, I know uh, when I think about um, regulations, um, we are uh, regulating. We are actually setting forth um, a clear vision of what design is supposed to be, which means there are guidelines, uh, there's expectations. And at the same time, we're trying to unleash innovation by removing the red tape 
that allows for uh, a multitude of other players to participate in the regeneration mm -hmm. of the city. How about the privatization part? How do you, where do you sit on that one? I mean, I, we, we're not doing um, you know, large, um, federally sponsored um, um, housing. Uh, yeah. What you saw was a commitment to uh, develop affordable housing by grafting it on and into every market rate housing development that goes on in the city. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's a very apt, in a sense, dis description of neoliberal policy that is still trying to affect change. In other words, you're working within mm -hmm. these economic structures that are more or less, there's no budget to do a large scale project even mm -hmm. if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and seeming to affect change. So, okay, but then this other, there's this other very traditional role that's ascribed to, to design specifically, and I mean like, like the design of a building, um, not just the spreadsheets. I mean, Mark was very eloquent, I think, about the spreadsheets, and we can get back to that. But uh, the design of the building to, 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 to in a sense, elicit the imagination. Uh, to think the world differently. In other words, to, to invite the imagination, as to say, to think differently, to speak to the imagination, not just to the bottom line. Uh, so now, it's possible to say that, that housing, the thing that we call housing, right, that we're discussing as housing, was kind of invented as a type, uh, a building type, you know, maybe 50 years ago, not that long ago. It didn't exist, really, in the, in the modern sense. Uh, until maybe 100 years ago. Uh, and, uh, and so it's, it's a relatively new building type. It's not uh, like so many of the archetypes that, that architectural uh, designers, students, and so on are familiar with, like churches uh, or other religious buildings, temples, um, or even public squares. Uh, of course, residential architecture has been around forever, but, but you know, and we have primitive huts and all of that. But, but here, I think, I'm, 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 I'm trying to, in a sense, test a little bit about where we are today in the spirit of evaluating paradigms uh, on the, the, the more or less strictly modernist claim uh, that, uh, you know, you mentioned Catherine Bauer would be a good example, uh, that housing can help change the world. By housing, by, by, by in a sense, bearing down, bringing, bringing all of the tools of the architectural imagination and the urban you know, planner, imagina urbanist imagination onto this type can help us reimagine the world, not just work within it, you know, within, within its givens, its constraints, but change it. So, so, so this is a short way of saying, like, if you were, what would have to change about the, the, the type that we call housing in order to the wor for the world to change? Right. Is that still on the table? Is that kind of thinking still on the table? Anybody here willing to, to, to stand with Catherine Bauer and other modernists and say, yes, the world has to change, and, and you know, changing the imagination, addressing the imagination through the design of a building might make some small contribution towards that kind of a change? What do you think? Well, I absolutely believe yeah. in that because I believe that um, if you think a human being needs health yeah. first, Second necessity is a refugee, mm -hmm. and that's there. Yeah, it's there. Right. It's a basic necessity for a human being to be uh, uh, it's, it, it its full, no? And it needs then the collectivity to become then this hu social human being. So I do absolutely believe that there is a, a huge uh, responsibility within designing a house, no? within yeah. designing a, um, a, a housing as well. Um, how do we translate that idea of designing a house and becoming a firm housing and not lose uh, the meaning of the, the act of design in mm -hmm. the way, in, in between? And I believe that um, part of it is uh, not reducing into a function or to a number. Right. So. And, uh, and I believe that uh, maybe we've tested already the function, the number, now what is next? What comes next? And I think it goes back to understanding the individual and the individual necessity of each of us of mm -hmm. being individual mm -hmm. and then being collective. It is not an op e easy op operation. No, it's more yeah. a question on how how yeah. to to do it than, than an answer. So in that sense, that you're sense. sort of reversing the the more classic modernist equation in which the collective is first. You know, a, 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 a sort of the German Siedlungen or something like that. 
uh, the, the, in which the units are all pretty much the same. Individuality is you know, not absent, but suppressed in favor of some sort of greater social whole. So the individual comes first. Does everybody agree? I'm curious. No. Am I, am, I, uh, <laughs> am I being unfair? <laughs> I would say, I mean, part of my position is that housing's not enough at this point. Yeah, all right, yeah, you said that, building, yeah, right. And that we need other programs embedded with housing mm -hmm. to really rethink our cities, mm -hmm. uh, because the motto doesn't, doesn't really answer the questions that are needed in the contemporary mm -hmm. city. I think that, uh, I did not describe the last project that I showed actually fit uh, fits that model um, very nicely. Um, the adaptive reuse of the, the stone soap building with additional housing. Yeah. Uh, what I what I didn't mention was uh, the the Shakespeare in Detroit, uh, an African American Shakespearean theater, was grafted onto what was otherwise a mixed use development project, and in many ways it kind of found its soul. So I couldn't agree with you more that one of the ways of um, making housing um, um, express more collective desires is to graft other things on it that uh, we love and hold dear, whether it's an early childhood learning center or, you know, um, locally owned shops, something that uh, forces it to um, be external. Uh, because inherently, if you're thinking about the private realm, um, you, you, you get into kind of a uniformity of uh, the housing expression. It's really only the public, I think, the public realm. Uh, and and um, um, encouraging buildings to um, make place for people to gather. Uh, so one of the things that um, was a common thread through all of the residential developments was this component of um, public, public space. And, you know, when Folks said, wow, you all in Detroit have so much space, it must be developing a new paradigm between how the private and the semi-private and the public intermingle. Well, you know, in the end, um, it, it hasn't emerged that the, um, the public, the private space, that outdoor space, uh, has radically changed. It's still, I was like envious of all those incredible balconies uh, in real estate uh, in the Studio Gang project, what I found um, was that um, we can um, encourage developers to give more of their space over to the public uh, and then begin to shape it uh, in plazas, in courtyards, in parks. Uh, so I'm, I'm seeing, it's not so much that because we have more space, people are having more outdoor private space. Actually, it's, they're having more public space. So it's at the service of something a little larger than the domestic scale. Mm -hmm. I would like to say only that you say imagination to the housing, and I think mm -hmm. it would be nice imagination, but intelligence to the housing mm -hmm. and reason okay. to the housing. No? Like Re reason. Yeah. Intelligence or, yeah. or something. And I just wanted to clarify that I didn't meant that I, uh, yeah. it's, it, it is talking from the private, exactly that's what I yeah, wanted yeah. to try to ban. It's about coming from the individual right. and the individual needs, which are private and collective. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it, is, it is, as I said, not coming from a spatial operation, like a functional operation, as in the modern times, right. or a financial operation, as in the uh, last decades of the last century, but uh, as an act of fulfilling like an individual social uh, necessity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, so I, I, it's interesting, I mean, how difficult it is, you know, once you start really s looking at this question, uh, to specify what the problem is, almost. And, and so, because another way, again, just using very traditional architectural vocabularies, um, to say this would, would be that housing is not a type in, in, let's say, the 1970s sense. It's not a Rossian archetype in the way that at least some of you have described the mixing of things. Uh, you know, if anything, you're militating to some extent, you know, in a rather technical way, you know, very, very, or, you know, very specific way, uh, against the purification of the type uh, as, uh, as a sort of, um, whether or not timeless, but at least uh, sort of legible building type. 
Uh, and and that, that speaks to design because it, not just to the to the planning of the of the building, to, but but you know to to virtually all of its formal characteristics, uh, because the legibility of that type was one of the, one of the great projects of the sort of middle to late uh, 20th century. Uh, in you know well, not, wasn't the only one, but it was certainly one of the more influential ones. And and as we as we tend paradigmatically maybe towards mixture. I mean, in other words. The question is whether mixture is a, is a key characteristic of this new paradigm. Um, we might have to then ask, because one of Rossi's and company's efforts was to hold back what they saw coming, uh, using the tools of architecture, to hold back the commercialization of architecture uh, by real estate development that began with the project of mixing programs in order to uh, optimize the, the potential returns on investment under different uh, investment conditions. So, um, so the, the distillation of this archetype into a kind of singular sort of abstraction was seen by some, at least, to resist commercialization. Uh, uh, you know, kind of development formulas, spreadsheets, and that sort of thing. Do you think that that's an available strategy or, a, or a useful strategy? Is it, is it, you know, uh, is it naive or, or meaningless to think along those lines? Uh, to, 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 in a sense, think the, the type of, to rethink typology, to put it more straightforwardly, uh, as a design problem for housing. I think that the, the variability not, not only goes to the type, as you're saying, I, I think it's go intrinsically in the type, yeah. as mm -hmm. Anna was uh, mentioning this morning, we're designing yeah. for a very, like the type is uh, um, trying to, to create a space for a family that really that describes that it doesn't exist yeah. in the majority right. of the cases. Right, right, right. So I think, it, as I said, it goes already from in there, you know, mm -hmm. how to uh, really uh, specifically house and allow um, uh, for more diversity, like bringing in the diversity instead of just bringing it out or right. in a combination. Right. No? You know, I will say, I mean, um, it's always uh, interesting. I mean, the issue of, of typology in Detroit yeah. is, uh, is, is not something um, that we're asked to reflect on um, so much because we, we have it already there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have literally thousands of bu buildings. We have banks, churches, schools, recreation centers, small factories that are a typology and they're empty. So we are trying to understand how you re-inhabit that, um, uh, not, um, which requires a level of uh, reinvention because we don't have the program pieces to fill them up. Um, we don't have the financial resources to rehab them all. So it's a fundamentally uh, different question. It's more about allocation of resources, mm -hmm. um, tactical ways mm -hmm. to re-inhabit. Well, you know, if you can't inhabit 100,000 square feet of a former school, of which we have 65 of vacant schools, mm -hmm. can you occupy 10,000 square feet? And mm -hmm. can you get that financed? And can you program it? If you can't finance 10,000, can you finance 1,000 and put the other 99,000 um, mothball it for another day. Mm -hmm. So they're just, the, you know, the, the types are there. It's the, the innovation and creativity that's required to not attack the problem in the exact same way that historically we have. You know, to go into a neighborhood uh, like the Fitzgerald neighborhood that has 100 vacant homes, it's nonsensical uh, to think about building new single family houses. Mm -hmm. So the strategy was how to create 230 um, gardens mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. So I, I think the circumstance kind of requires a level of invention and creativity, which quite frankly I saw in the work in Mexico. I mean, there was clearly invention happening because of the circumstances, the resources available for the, the, the groups that they were working. And so I actually think that um, kind of mother invention are these kind of areas that have necessitate other strategies. Mm -hmm. I also think that the purity of solely housing, mm -hmm. which I think is a kind of, uh, has been the way that we have seen housing traditionally, I guess I feel like it needs some rethinking mm -hmm. and that the kind of this hybrid condition is not a bad thing. Like mm -hmm. I actually right. think that it, it has the capacity to uh, have a level of dexterity 
a level of kind of connection to uh, spe specific programs that help to create identity for certain areas. Mm -hmm. And I think that it also offers architects really interesting combinations. It's a kind of challenge to imagine, you know, all kinds of programs that are normally seen as singular objects viewed as their own thing. And then if they're embedded with housing, how, how would that allow mm -hmm. us to reimagine what our cities could be. I mm -hmm. think it's an interesting problem to be thinking about. And then each climatic zone and local condition has to rethink what that is in their own way. So there's no singular answer to any of these problems. Mm -hmm. So uh, do we have time for one more scale of this? Uh, one more iteration <laughs> is the North America part, mm -hmm. um, which is to me very interesting uh, uh, for this reason. Um, this is... Uh, you will recognize uh, as a provocation, but but I hope uh, one that uh, it produces you know a certain amount of thought. That uh, it seems to me that that assembling the question of housing, like articulating the question of housing at the scale of of something like a continent across borders, asks the question of the border. And specifically housing, because housing, you know, in its different phases uh, across the 20th century, uh, has been a function to a large extent of national and then municipal policy. Uh, and, and so I'm tempted to ask it in this way. Can there be a North American housing policy? Uh, and if so, what would that look like? In other words, Maurice, if you, <laughs> so if you were to rewrite North American housing policy at the continental scale, what would have to happen for, for that to be a plausible thought? Um, it's another way of, of asking us to think the continent on which we live together and work together uh, by erasing its borders and rather than building walls, erasing. Now, of course, that has all kinds of um, consequences. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could, we could use architecture to test those consequences. Uh, a kind of a corollary to that, um, since this part of North America is currently being governed by a real estate developer, and the real estate developer is the paradigmatic figure for in our corner of the of neoliberal uh, life uh, of the neoliberal city, can you imagine, you know, if you can imagine a North America without border walls and guards and all of that, uh, can you imagine a, a North American city without a real estate developer in it? Can you imagine what a city would be that was not designed, financed, produced, and governed by real estate developers? Well, first of all, I do think the importance of calling it this uh, North America is am amazing because I was just 10 days ago in a, in a conference where Mexico was South America. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <You> can, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was going to ask you, where do, where, where do you prefer? Mexico is North America. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I would say, let's start like really okay. stating that this is North America and that... Um, uh, and what I, are the pros and cons of being North or South? Well, uh, there's North America, there's Central America and South. It's yeah, just a geographic just thing. Geographic. It doesn't okay. exist. Okay. I don't, uh, I don't okay. know. Anyway. You know? Anyway. <laughs> um, uh, I think there, there, there are both pros and cons of yeah. being this part of yeah. that part. Yeah. And what, what, but what is truth and it's real is that it is, we are a region uh, in many, 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 many ways. Mm -hmm. And may, probably the only way we're not a region is politically, but economically, culturally, right. socially, uh, we are one region, no? Economically, uh, yes. We, we have been we integrated have, economically. Yes, okay. Yes. Okay, but, but, but what, what does that mean for housing? More, what does that mean for housing? Uh, yeah. Socially, we were uh, almost like. Yeah. Um, uh, and 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 culturally more and more every day. So I I do uh, not imagine it. Uh, it exists. New York has yeah. a neighborhood, yeah. Elmhurst, Queens, which yeah. is called Puebla York. I yes, mean, yes. It, it has a substantial amount of Mexicans living yeah. there. So yeah. I can already imagine a city that uh, it is a, a mixture of uh, of places because it already exists. And how would that city be governed? And I think it's also interesting, you made a study in Yale, I think, or I don't know where, that it's the Mexicans that used to live here and then go to Mexico and they start doing like American-ish 
type of houses, no? So you have Puebla York, but you also have like little Brooklyn houses in Michoacán. So, mm -hmm. and I also like that it's Mexi Mexico can be Latin America, North America, or South America. It's mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. We and have also, a lot of at opportunities. The same time, I think um, latitude matters. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the kind of building questions that we ask ourselves, you know, we're going from plus 40 to minus 40 Celsius, yeah. our envelope issues, yeah. the cost of square foot construction is so related to our climatic zone, the kind of issue, so, and that impacts mm -hmm. housing because it has sure. the financial kind of, you know, so, so, so I would say that what's so interesting is at one level, the cultural issues are, are, are so similar in many ways, and the kind of uh, different relationships actually create a richer North America, and yet the kind of specificity of the local condition related to construction is actually very different. And, and I like that play between what is actually kind of more common and what is actually specific at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the, these kinds of conversations make us aware, more aware of what is called, what what those the differences and the the sort of enormous similarities simultaneously. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was in, uh, intrigued by the um, uh, Mexicans' national policy uh, of people's right to housing. Um, what a you know phenomenal aspiration, um, and I can only think that um, uh, imagine the concept uh, where everyone felt they had a democratic right. To live in a socially, economically, environmentally uh, healthy uh, community, uh, to take it to the scale of community, and um, how um, a policy—I mean, a, a national policy—where um, you could assure um, a long tenure in in housing, so that the pressures of of urbanization were not um, a force for displacement, uh, and so. Thinking about how that plays out on a local level, you know, the city of Detroit has um, surveyed every uh, re federally regulated affordable housing in the city and has made a commitment uh, to retain, um, to not allow them to expire. Uh, and so it's 10,000 units that have to be uh, protected in, over the next five years uh, and to raise the finances to assure that. So. That's on a local city level. One could imagine that as a national policy for these cities that um, have uh, been um, um, rapidly displacing um, uh, poor people. So, I mean, I think in, in, in the end, it has to be a, a set of policies that can be, be implemented. I suspect that the um, laboratory is probably cities um, before it becomes a national. Hmm. Well, I more and more believe that um, they're, they're the cities that uh, are the next countries, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, what you say it comes to that, yeah. no? There's yeah. not a possibility of applying like uh, 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 any more these nationalistic mm -hmm. or regionalistic mm -hmm. operations, and more and more we need to go from the individual operations to the more Mm -hmm. But I think the lesson okay. from Mexico. I mean, if, if you were to if you were to do something mm -hmm. in erasing the borders, you would actually learn that lesson yep, and absolutely. apply it all across mm -hmm. North America. Mm -hmm. And then you would also, you know, sort of the, shift the right to housing. The, the right yeah. to housing for yeah. everyone is a kind of it's a fundamental yeah. condition. Mm -hmm. And you know, there there are countries like Singapore yes. where, in effect, they see the housing of their citizens as the biggest resource yeah. because the, the people are their, their, their kind of human uh, capital. economy. Yeah. Human, mm -hmm. capital. human capital, that's, that's another, yet another neoliberal uh, gem. Uh, but, but the, okay, just, I can't resist this. Does, does that, does that um, mean that this is the NAFTA panel? <laughs> I mean, is anybody, honestly, is anybody here against NAFTA? NAFTA had, I mean, NAFTA no, was not perfect. No. Even I, from Detroit, because there have been, you know, very persuasive arguments made that NAFTA was responsible for the deindustrialization de to some degree uh, of the uh, auto industry. So, yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the single, uh, you know, economic uh, driver of a city, uh, a, a singular one, is the death of any city. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think uh, um, car, cars happen to be Detroit's, but I, mm -hmm. I would agree that kind of monolithic monoculture is the real um, challenge. Hillary has stood up, so I think we're getting a signal. 
unfortunately have to conclude right. for the day. And it's been a really amazing, intense panel. And I want to thank everyone, all the speakers across the day. And for many of you traveled through a blizzard, maybe have not even slept. I really oh, appreciate God. you yeah. being here. Thank you, Reinhold, thank you. for the last session. Thank you so much. Thank you.